Welcome everyone. This is um, the student panel of Celebrate Learning Week 2024. The Celebrate Learning Week theme is um, remembering the human in the loop. And we will have the theme in our mind as we continue. I, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that I am um, the moderator, Judy Chan. I am an education consultant at UBC, and I'm at UBC where we are situated on the traditional and seated and ancest ancestral land of the Miskwim First Nation. And we also acknowledge that we have panelists as well as audience who are joining us from the Silk Okanagan Nations, um, also a traditional ancestral and, and seated territory of the UBC Okanagan campus. I would also like to acknowledge many of you who would like me joining from our home that is scattered around different First Nation land. And for me, I'm very fortunate when I look out the window I can see two humongous pie trees, and on our campuses, there are also so many trees. When I look at all these trees, I remind myself that in the indigenous culture, tree is regarded as the knowledge and wisdom keeper. They witness all the events that happened around us. They are keeping the data around where we've been in the in the last thousands and hundreds of years. I wish, my hope is that one day we will be able to script the data from all their memory and we can learn from them. I wonder what generative AI would say about all the knowledge, what lessons we are going to learn. But before generative AI is able to scrap the knowledge and the wisdom from our trees and our nature, I think the, the minimum we can do is to sit down, listen, listen to the nature, watch it and learn from them. And at the same time, continue to think about how we can continue to protect our land um, around us. There's so much that we can learn from our trees and our nature. So at the same time, we also want to acknowledge that uh, we really want to provide, as educator, I call myself an educator, we really want to provide the best possible conditions for learning, researching, working, where each one of us, including our students, will be respected, where we will be possible to learn, live, and work in a positive and supportive environment. This is especially important for me today because I feel that I am a little, I'm a little mother hand here protecting our students. Our students panelists are so brave. Um, they are accepting some level of vulnerability to share the thinking, to be very candid. Among 81 of us, the number is climbing, um, to share the thoughts. Some of you may be their professor. Some of you may actually be holding the term paper right now at the moment. I know the past, the great deal day has been passed, but some of you are still marking and grading. But they are, they, they, they're volunteering their time. And so please um, be kind to each other, be kind to my students. If I notice anyone is giving, saying anything that is hurtful, I may use my ability to ask you to leave. So let's create a safe space for our students who are so brave to share and so generous. A quick agenda for today. Welcome, welcome everyone for spending the next hour and a half to listen to our students. And I made my land acknowledgement. I acknowledge the trees outside of my window. A little bit of housekeeping and our, about our journeys together before how, how the students met and what we plan to do. Um, of course, we I would like to introduce the student very soon. And the panel discussion, um, the panel discussion is part of our journey. We'll be, we will be following um, a book that I just started reading. I haven't finished, um, Ethan Mollick's um, Co-Intelligencies, Living and Working with AI. So I'm still working on it. I'm working and learning from it. At the end, near the end, um, our students have something that they really want to say. 
that I wasn't planned it. I I I didn't expect that that you wanted to say that. So I wanted to leave room for them to say something that they really want to say to you. We will have time for question and answer at the end. So just want to remind everyone we are having this um student panel as a webinar format. So a little orientation of what a webinar looks like here. Um, we will be mainly using the question and answer feature on the webinar. It's not just a place for you to ask us questions or ask the students questions. We will be asking you some questions too, and we would like you to use that space to give us some responses. And um, and only the some of the administrative administrative support staff from CTLT, my partner, my my um, panel partner, Manuel and I and the students will be able to see your questions and your responses. Um, audience members, you will not be able to see each other's responses. This is just the way how this webinar has been set up. And um, when you ask us questions, we will, we will, we are talking behind the scene and we will decide when we are going to respond and who is going to respond and um, near the second half of this um, session. If you are asking a question, um, just because there's six students here, there's 90 of us here, um, audience, um, may I ask you to say something like, hey, John, I heard you mention something. Give a little bit information and context. May I ask all the students to respond to that? Or if you have a questions for a particular student, please also say, hey, I have a questions for Joe. Something so that we can help us if understand what your question is about. Thank you very much for co your coordination. That will also help my work and Marelle's work. Um, housekeeping, that's it. And then next slide, I am moving. Yeah, the journey. I just wanted to know, we when we plan to celebrate Learning Week, we know for sure we wanted to listen to our students. So um, a few CTLT staff and colleagues and faculty members, we just asked around, do we know any amazing students who has something to say about AI? So we email them, we invite them to join. Some of them will not be able to join because of work, but we have six students who are willing to volunteer the time, step away from their summer work, their summer studies, and spend an hour and a half here. We also met last week. Um, we discussed some of the questions that a few of us at the planning committee has been gathering from faculty members, from students. Um, we share our current interests and what we know about AI with each other among the panelists. And I also asked the panelists, hey, you are volunteering your time here for nothing and you are exposing, you are going to experience some vulnerability. I really want to make sure that our panelists will, panelists will get something out from this experience. So I asked them, what will bring you joy at the end of this panel discussion? They are so humble. They said they would love to interact with the audience and learn how the audience, you, are using AI in the classroom. Or if you're not yet, why not? Or you've decided not to use it, again, why not? So maybe, yes, we only have the question and answer. So we ask you a question. We would like to hear. This is a, a question, an invitation. Please share with our panelists. Type it in the chat. Um, No, not the chat. Type it in the question and answer and let our student panel to know um, how you've been using or why you decide not to use AI yet or why you think you still don't know what sure what to do. Let, let our student panelists know, please. I During this awkward silence, I just want to say, again, if you're driving, don't type. Um, I'm going to wait for about five to seven responses before I continue. And I suspect some of you will be like, no, I'm not going to respond. I want the students to experience what radio silence feels like when instructor asks questions during class and no students 
no one responded. So, yes, take the time. Thank you very much. I actually see more than five responses now. I will move on. But if you're in the middle of typing a sentence, please continue and finish your thought. Thank you for sharing. The questions. So what the questions, this is the process. Like I said, like I share, we gather a, we gather a lot of questions. We actually have a lot of questions that we would like our students to respond to. So we arrange the questions in according to the principles that's been mentioned by Ethan Malik in his book. I move the principle around. I move um, be the human in the loop to the last principle, just because the theme I will celebrate on a week is to re remembering the human in the loop. And so principle number one will be always invite AI to the table. Two is treat AI like a person but at the same time, we should tell it what kind of person we want it to be. Three is assume this is the worst AI that we will ever use. It will only get better. And principle four, be the human in the loop. And then again, like I said, the student have something to say. So finally, let me introduce you the panelists and we will start spotlighting them so then they will also you would not be just seeing me. You're so uncomfortable being the only person on screen for so long. Um, we have Hashini Zurama, who is a graduate student, um, fourth year PhD in computer science. She's also, um, aside from her regular study and her research, she's also working on other research projects on campus. Jacket and Fond, she's graduating, yes. Um, I think she mentioned something about submitting her last paper last week. Um, she's also a coordinator on our digital tattoo project. Kevin Wan, joining us, a graduate student joining us from UBC Okanagan. Mohammed, um, also a third year student in electrical engineering. He is currently serving as an LT Hub Rover, I believe. Tian, also an undergraduate student, um, but, but in statistic, also helping with a student, a, a student developer on a project. William Kahn, um, currently doing his um, third year, I think, in computer science and math. And he was a tech rover last term. Both Jacqueline and William had served as a panelist last in November during this AI symposium. So thank you very much, panelists. So what I've asked the panelists is we when we met last week, we sort of share our interests. So we we sort of arrange it so then everyone would get a chance to say something. Um, there are many of us. So I will be timing them. I will be giving them a little signal when the two or three minute mark is up. So be very concise. And Jacqueline, I see you on the screen. And are you ready? Thank you, Jacqueline, because you are an experienced panelist. We invite her to start us off. Yeah. Thanks. Principle number one, Jacqueline. Over yeah, so, to you. Um, yeah, sharing uh, some of my experience uh, of how I invited AI in my learning environment. So basically, I usually use AI for proofreading uh, my work after completion, because in my coursework, I usually write essays and reflection papers, and I needed to spend a lot of time for reading my work. So using generative AI actually saves me a lot of time. And uh, it can sometimes help me to write in a more concise and also clear manner, especially when I work on assignments in late evenings. Kevin. Uh, all right. So, um, well, for me, I'm a computer science master student, so I do a little bit of research and also I have uh, the other side of the things is uh, coding and developing uh, applications. Uh, so the first part that I feel is instrumental actually helped me a lot is doing research. Um, as undergrad or students, one of the uh, skills that we were trained to do is to do research. And we search on the library page. We find articles that are peer reviewed and stuff. 
And um, uh, recently, um, maybe in the past few months, uh, they have gotten a lot better, especially in doing research. So you can uh, find uh, plugins on ChatGPT, for example, uh, that can uh, give you, uh, that can research based on what you are writing about. Find the relevant articles, and uh, you can click the articles to make sure that they are correct, that they are real articles, and um, give you a little summary, and you can quickly see, oh, are these research articles really what I want? And for me, that really expedites the process of filtering through articles that I don't really need, because um, it's less on a, just a semantic search of keywords, but uh, on what you actually do it. Uh, it's a much more precise uh, search process. And second of all, it really helps in expanding ideas. Uh, I can ask it to, oh, uh, what are some directions in this area, for example? And uh, yeah, outside of research, of course, it helps a lot with coding. Uh, if you are have done anything related to that, uh, the co-pilot and the debugging uh, with ChatGPT, whatever it is, it really helps increase the efficiency. I feel like I'm a team now by myself <laughs> because of AI. So I really have been using it quite a bit, and I feel like in these two areas, it has helped me a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Mohammed. Yeah, so uh, I took a more proactive approach to incorporating AI into my learning environment. Uh, I like sought out ways to customize the, the AI tools that were available to my specific needs and uses. And so I was able to create like personalized study guides and like mind maps for my learning styles. And I found that to be incredibly useful. Um, it enabled me to kind of uh, expand on ideas coming from like engineering. There's a lot of like application stuff. And so you need to really conceptualize and understand the material. And it helped me kind of break that into digestible bites, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, I've personally used uh, generative AI both in uh, working environment and in studying. So when I study, uh, personally, I only use generative AI when I get stuck. And uh, most of the time, uh, what from what I have found is that since I'm a fourth year student, so my coursework are really advanced, and most of the time I I see that at best the AI is give very broad answer and sometimes maybe even wrong, and at worst they just flat out wrong or <laughs> yeah like or, or they're very like uncertain about their answer right. And it, it it could also be because of the way I prompt the AI, but that's that's my observation when working with AI in like a studying settings, and in uh for my work uh since I'm a student developer, so I write a lot of programs and codes. Uh, I find that generative AI is very helpful in doing the repetitive stuff. For example, like if I need to code out something that I I remember how to code it in the past, but I just don't quite remember exactly what I did. I can also ask the AI, hey, can you help me generate this this part of the code? And I'll I'll take a look at it and I I will run it. And most of the time it's correct, but sometimes it's it could be wrong here and there, but it's very minor. So I found that generative AI is very useful in programming settings. Thank you for, very much for sharing how you invite AI to your learning environment. Now, may, let's move on to the next one. Treat AI like a person. Hmm. And tell it what kind of person it is. I, we heard from Mahmoud a little bit about personalizing it, customizing it. So I would like to ask Hoshini, William, and Mohammed again. Like When you invite them to your learning environment, what type of guest do you want it to be? Maybe a friend, a tutor, an instructor, why and how you do that. Um, and again, similar to the last slide, how is your experience so far? Hashimi? Yeah, so um, I would say the beauty of large language models, specifically, but also generative AI by and large, lies in diversity. 
um, which allows um, us to leverage the same model for different tasks. So in educational settings, a large language model can kind of embody multiple roles. So it can be all of these things. For example, um, you know, as a cheerful tutor, um, you could use generative AI to encourage students um, to explore and learn through positive reinforcement. Um, you know, you could help provide hints or explanations when they're stuck or answer their questions in a friendly tone. Um, in certain times, you can it can even offer um, amusing, uh, you know, ways to think about how a certain solution was built, or uh, if you if you have trouble understanding a concept or how it was described in a book and you can't quite understand it, it can help provide examples that can further cement your understanding. Um, as a critical instructor, for example, um, a, a large language model can help challenge students to think more critically about, um, you know, a certain assignment, for example, an essay by playing devil's advocate. It can possibly, you know, um, encourage them to reflect on different viewpoints or, um, you know, uh, defend their arguments in a logical way, for example. Um, and I've seen a lot of instances online where people have used um, large language models such as Chat GPT to prep themselves for an interview, for an internship or a job, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, but ultimately, I think it's essential to understand that at this stage, large language models, for example, Chat GPT, they're better suited for creative tasks due to their impressive ability to generate content that can align with human intentions. So um, as other panelist members have said that while they can sometimes um, accurately explain academic concepts, their limitations lie in factual consistency and critical thinking. So um, large language models at this stage, they're essentially just remixing words. They're learning how to predict the next word given what the user wants. So um, using them as a cheerful tutor or a witty friend in creative tasks is safer than relying on them as a critical instructor or a knowledgeable mentor for like, you know, purely knowledge-based tasks. Um, so um, I guess this highlights the importance of when we're um, supplementing AI-assisted learning um, with such technologies, we should um, also ensure that there's a level of human oversight to ensure um, at what stages does it make sense to use generative AI and after what stage should we just rely on the standard educational principles that have worked for so many years. Thank you, Hashimi. Oh, I also forgot to add uh, my experience so far. So um, I'm currently a PhD in computer science student. And obviously with research, a lot of my job comes into writing because your research is only as good as re as, re as it is reproducible. And, on, and the best way to make sure that your research is reproducible and helpful is to write it in the best way possible. So I've used generative AI in the past to uh, you know, give me ideas on how to rewrite a certain paragraph to increase its clarity. Um, uh, what are some details that, uh, or some argument pieces that I could possibly add to a paragraph to cement what I'm talking about? Um, in terms of specific large language model-based tools that are not ChatGPT, I've had colleagues um, mention that they've used tools like Elicit, which is this website which can actually find research papers that answer a particular question. So I've, I've heard that it has like varying degrees of success, but it can at least help um, figure out what are the most relevant papers that you should look into. Then there's this other tool that I've also heard about, it's called Chat PDF, where you can upload, for example, a research paper. And then you essentially just ask the large language model, what is this research about? What are the limitations? What is the study? And the best part about this is sometimes even if the language and the paper was hard to understand, you can, in your conversation with the large language model, figure out what they were talking about. So those are some specific tools that colleagues have used and they've found a lot of um, them to be really helpful. William. Hi everyone, super glad to be here and so glad to see some people here. I guess compared to like last year, these AI tools are a lot more mature. 
so we can have a much better answers and a better understanding of what they can do. So we can speak more to about these things and come up with better policies. So great to see so many professors here. It just shows that you really care. And so for me, my use goes from either like the surface level. I, th I think the easiest use is like an internet search, a Google search. Except the difference is you can always get an answer. Sometimes Google, you might not find it. But with ChatGPT, you ask something, it might hallucinate, but you will get something. So that's like the most surface level. Everyone can use it like that. But then as you get to like the more advanced stuff where we start getting close to like a mentor or tutor, stuff that Harsnye Her mentioned, such as interview prep, that was advocate for writing essays, that's like the much more creative uses, but also the more like difficult uses of AI. You need to know how to prompt it properly. But I guess for me, I think one limitation of these tools and the biggest difference between an AI and an actual human mentor is that a human mentor does not need prompting. They can just watch you do things and then they can see or just give you advice based on what they see. But for you, if you're using ChatGPT, you need a prompt and you might not be able to think of a prompt or you might not realize you need to prompt for this. But a human mentor will just come in there and say, hey, I noticed you do this, but maybe you should do it this way, stuff like that. So for me, that's a little bit of a barrier, but I do think that tools are trying to implement stuff like that, such as I noticed in ChatGPT recently, if you say something like, I am a blank, I am a computer science student, it will say memory updated. So it's trying to learn more about you because that's another limitation. It's context, trying to understand who you are and your current standing. Such as if I know someone's in computer science at UBC, I can immediately just start telling them things from my experience or, hey, maybe you should take this math course or this is what I think. So context and also prompting is like the biggest difference that from an AI and a person, at least that's what I feel. But for my experience so far, I think one of the biggest use cases is just getting started on a topic. So as if I'm studying for like a midterm or final, like many classes, they give like a list of topics, right? So I can just take that list, put it in ChatGPT and ask, hey, please explain these concepts like a five or like I'm a struggling computer science student. Please tell me how to get started. Give me a little breakdown. So that's one of the use cases that I found that's been like really helpful, mainly just getting started. Because once you get started, then a lot of things just follow through and students in general, once you break that little starting barrier, then, then you have that motivation, then it's much easier to just finish the rest. So yeah, that's my experience so far. Mohammed, your turn. Yeah, um, me personally, I kind of combine uh, certain aspects of it being a knowledgeable mentor and like a, a, a witty friend where I have it basically uh, I have conversations with it based off of a certain material that like uh, I wouldn't understand immediately. And it kind of goes back to uh, what William was saying earlier with the prompting. It's uh, when with the new tools, you can actually talk to the large language model. So you can have a conversation and if it doesn't understand, you can follow up in like natural language. And so prompting has become easier more recently. And I think... Uh, that's definitely something people are going to be utilizing much more. Um, going back to the, the knowledgeable mentor and friend thing, where I basically, the way I tailored it before, my like assistance for studying was I'd uh, take some of the uh, topics and units that I don't really have a full grasp on and have it break it down, similar to what William was saying. Um, in more application approaches, it's not that useful. And uh, that's where it kind of helps me become more creative, giving me ideas on how I could try to apply them. But I have to do a lot of the thinking still, right? And so I think it's still uh, early. And like uh, uh, Judy mentioned in the beginning, this is probably the worst we're ever going to see AI be. And so we're only looking to a more potentially better future. We'll see. <laughs> Um, but uh, as for my experience so far, I think it's quite positive, uh, treating it like a sort of assistant, uh, and interacting with it like a, you would a normal human. That way you can have more casual and natural conversations that kind of tailor towards you as a person, because everybody's different. Thank you very much. I think every student had a chance to say something already and I hope that they are not as nervous or anxious as before and may be able to start looking at the questions you ask. Um, so audience, please continue to type your questions. We will 
have some time to respond to your questions later. Um, yes, we also noticed thing we trying to work on the, the background noise too. So thank you for letting us know. And continue, please use the Q&A as a place where you can, you may not have a question, but if you have a comment, please also share with um, the panelists here using the Q&A. So next question, like um, Mohammed just mentioned, principle number three, and Malik, even Malik is saying that this is going to be the worst AI that we are using now, like it will get, only get better. So the questions for us, for the students would be, like, how are you going to continue to develop? Where is it hindering? Because now you can always ask ChatGPT to help you think critically, solve a problem. Does it really hinder your development um, in terms of some of these skills? Um, maybe we can also add creativity here too, because a couple of you use is use, using AI as a creative assistant. Um, or maybe perhaps also looking into the future. Do you think your education path would have changed um, or will change? Or are you planning to change your education path now that AI is here? Um, what other new skills do you think you will need? Assuming that you still have a couple of years here at UBC and what is something that we can provide you, the educators? So, Harishin and Jacqueline. Hashini, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as, as others have said, you know, as like even William, for example, just recently, but generative AI is really good for surface level tasks and activities, you know, for example, if you're struggling how to write an email to respond to someone, it can help draft a first draft, um, summarize documents, you know, write code snippets that can help you understand how to code a certain thing or answer, you know, even like, uh, for example, customer support type questions. Um, so it, it really helps um, people uh, be more efficient at routine tasks. But then because large language models are just kind of like remixing words. Um, if users tend to rely too heavily on generative AI for direct answers, um, not only can it prevent them from actually accessing correct resources to form correct opinions, but in doing so with this over-reliance, it can also um, in the future, discourage them from deeply analyzing problems or question underlying assumptions themselves first before approaching generative AI. Um, and also, you know, because um, these models can generate plausible sounding answers that may not always be accurate or rooted in comprehensive analysis, users, you know, they might forego, as I said, ver um, verifying the information that's provided in these answers because they sound reasonable. And this reliance in this way can also hinder their um, analytical skills. So it's crucial to remember that while um, large language models can support creativity and efficiency, their reliance or even worse over-reliance on prediction uh, than genuine understanding means that they can't really replicate the depth of human reasoning. So um, educators, teachers, and learners um, should aim to use generative AI tools in alongside strategies that cultivate critical thinking, the hard skills. Um, and uh, an example for this is I I recently just finished being a teaching assistant for a computer science grad course. Um, and what I really liked about that course were that the assignments, they were weekly and they were about um, reading research papers that were assigned for that week and then writing summaries. The summaries part, uh, to a certain extent, you could possibly use ChatGPT to generate summaries, but a really major component of these assignments was also asking critical research questions that, um, you know, uh, that provide a good comprehensive and understandable and clear criticism of the works that the authors did, the, the limitations of their approach and what you would do if you wanted to improve upon it. And what we found was that it's much easier to use generative AI for the summarization part than it is to ask the model, okay, here's the paper, give me a very good research-based critical question. So this is an example of like where instructions 
instructors can try to ensure that their assignments are also testing these hard skills that at this stage, large language models are not great at. Um, and in terms of how my education pathway has changed, I would say it's well, with all these tools being readily accessible, it's great to see that people are focusing more on, you know, user reliance and over reliance from a research perspective and even explainable AI to see what the model looked at to form its answer. You know, with large language models, it's chain of thought reasoning, for example. So these are topics that I've always been passionate about. And it's good to see that more and more people are getting into these hard hitting research based areas. Um, however, that being said, personally, my PhD research area is not that directly impacted by this because it's not really related to natural language processing. I work with deep learning on eye tracking data to predict things about the user, for example, their emotions, their cognitive abilities, their health conditions. And the thing here is the data sets um, that contain these information are really small. And the other thing to note about large language models is they work because they scrape all the data that you can get from the internet. So when it comes to specialized tasks that use specialized data, for example, eye tracking, you can just directly use a, use a generative AI or a transformer-based model right off the bat. So my research has kind of been orthogonal to this new advent and interest that's been into generative AI, but it's very interesting to see the different capabilities and the new papers that keep coming every month now. Um, and in terms of what skills um, would be important? I think the first one would be to the ability to actually understand how a piece of technology works. Um, an example for this that the other panelist members have mentioned is understanding hallucinations. Um, you know, there was like this news article that was released um, months ago where there was this lawyer um, who, who was working for a man suing an airline for a routine personal injury. And the lawyer ended up using Chad GPT to um, bring up fake cases that he presented at the court. Um, and so that's an example of people taking plausible sounding answers for actually uh, grounded responses. Um, so it's really important to uh, figure out how a piece of technology works before you just use it for any purpose whatsoever. The other skill is um, like, bringing into account um, ethical considerations. I remember seeing a question that was related to this in the chat, but, you know, recent events like the SAC strike, where one of the reasons was the advent of generative AI to generate new content, such as scripts, um, or even, you know, um, in for, with visual artists, like uh, talking about how DAL-E, when it generates visual content, it takes explicit parts from specific artistic styles, which could be considered plagiarism. So um, it's really important to develop um, an ethical uh, lens to view how these solutions impact people for the better and more importantly, for the worse. So I think, yeah, these, these would be the most um, crucial. Thank you, Harshini. Jacqueline, the data set, the librarian. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I think Hashini did like a really uh, great uh, summary of like some of the issues that uh, the use of Gen AI tools and also some of the skills that we need when we are using these tools. So I would like to expand on some of her points. So um, actually, um, like I feel it as in a more positive or more optimistic way of thought, I would say. So um, yes, uh, for sure, like Gen AI, um, um, these tools, the existence and also the convenience um, they bring might hinder some of um, the development of hard skills like critical thinking or problem solving. But I think like everything uh, has both sides, I would say. And then like uh, what Hashini mentioned that it's important for us to know how these tools work. So given like based on this um, understanding, I think it's a good way for us to develop critical thinking skills as well. So say like if we know that actually AI tools, yes, they are uh, really convenient uh, to use and also they can provide us with um, like uh, nicely formed information um, in a second. But at the same time, if we understand um, how these could be hallucination or there's inaccuracy there. So I think this uh, is a way of critical thinking as well. That is like 
we have this mindset to uh, try to uh, verify um, um, the accuracy of information. And I think that um, uh, as some of um, uh, the students may be using AI as tutors. So this actually kind of, I would say, like an echo to like in classroom environment and especially like in an information age, like we are receiving information from everywhere. And Jane and AI tools now with uh, these generated content is one uh, source of information. So when we are like um, absorbing incoming information, we should always have that mindset of like, whether this is true or not, or uh, whether this represents the whole scene. So I think like, um, um, of course, uh, understanding um, AI, um, I, I mean, the generative output, there might be something that uh, like students may take it as a shortcut, but like at the same time, if we educate students well, um, this could be like a good way for us to train critical thinking as well. So I kind of see like some possibility there, I would say. And also, yeah, as my education pathway, that is like super relevant, I would say, uh, since I'm from the library school. So as a student from uh, high school, so generative AI has certainly changed my uh, education path a lot. And as a student uh, myself, uh, especially um, for using test generators, uh, they help a lot uh, when I'm working on my assignments and it saves a lot of time when I am um, using them to refine and polish my work. And also I just saw a question about um, um, like how when we are using these AI tools uh, to kind of like make our work more concise, how do I see my role as a writer? So uh, honestly, I would say uh, uh, before I pursue my library degree, I was an English major. And then uh, I, when I am using these AI tools to refine my work, I'm not treating um, the proof uh, red product as my final product. I always take a second look at it. So I do not think it kind of like take away my role as a writer because like in, um, I would say like in the process of writing is always back and forth. And then uh, you have to like think uh, in different um, ways to kind of like refine your work. So uh, I would say in, in my experience, I do not think that it kind of like take away my role as a writer because it always involves editing and proofreading and AI is just a very great tool for us to use um, to make uh, this process like kind of like speed up the process a little bit. And then uh, also going back to my education pathway. So uh, I would say uh, with all this rapid development of uh, AI, um, um, I would say it kind of uh, make me reflect on like how these conveniences are actually bringing some ethical issues like what Hashini mentioned just now. So um, that is like, uh, for example, like um, while these uh, tools are very um, good for us to use for knowledge synthesis, but at the same time, there are ethical issues, for example, pri privacy concerns and also copyright issues. So um, Indeed, like these tools, I think they offer new ways for people to create like content and process information. And uh, as a high school student, I would say um, uh, I have invested a significant amount of time to learn how these tools work, like uh, what Hashini mentioned, that uh, how I could um, like understand how these tools work and also in uh, my um, within like um, the high school community and maybe in my future workplace, uh, I would like to um, kind of support people um, advocating like how uh, we should be uh, mindful when we are using these tools. Thank you. So many changing, not changing our path or going deeper. We can detour. Okay, principle number four. Mm, I'm not sure. Let me see. Yes. So we have a lot of questions. We still had a lot of questions last week when we met with the panelists. So we sort of divide the question into two parts. Um, they both, all these questions sort of address being the human in the loop. Um, Tian, Hashini, Kevin. I know we haven't heard from Tian and Kevin for a while. If you have something to add, um, how are you going to be living or being a human in the loop and use AI to augment your learning? Where do you think you are in the loop? Um, and a few questions. This is actually addressing some of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A. 
Like, how are you going to evaluate? And also, Jacqueline also mentioned that the quality and the reliability of Gen AI output in your learning while you are only a student yourself. So, Tian? Yeah, so for me, um, I always put myself in the in the loop at the center. So I, I would like to be in charge of like, uh, in, in terms of solving the problem. And I would like to put out my line of reasoning without, you know, hand it completely over to the, to the AI, right? So, but I do incorporate the AI in, in, in this process. So for example, when I'm solving a, an assignment problem, I, I always start with myself. I always start to reason through it, but then on every iteration of my reasoning, I, I will try to ask the AI, Hey, does my line of reasoning make sense? And from what I from, from from that uh kind of workflow, I found out that the the AI is more useful in that sense because uh I um sometimes it's it's say yes, okay, your reasoning make perfect sense and but and but then sometimes it's say no, uh, uh you should consider this, consider that. So when I see that, I, I do not like always, oh my god, I, I'm wrong. But it, it will actually like tell me, oh uh, I actually like stop. And then take take a take a thinking about it, and maybe I will double check with my course note and or like any materials in the course that I'm doing to see hmm, if that makes sense. But it like if the AI say that I'm wrong, I'm not completely like freak out and think that I'm wrong. But it will actually make me stop and okay reason it again to see if like my own reasoning makes sense. And um, in terms of how do I evaluate the quality and rel reliability of of the outputs, uh, since my the my workflow is like that, uh, so my only way of evaluating it is that I check the course note because that's the most like you know I, I use my course note is like my ground truth right so that even the AI hallucinate I can just catch it right away, um so for me that's the way I would evaluate it and sometimes I I could also do a quick Google search but then again that's also kind of similar to using an AI because you're seeking like external source to, valid to validate your reasoning. So since I always put myself first in the loop and if I need to validate my reasoning, I usually uh, approach the course note first before like I try to ask the AI. But sometimes the AI can point out things that I think, hmm, maybe that could make sense. So I actually look like, you know, seek it out on Google or maybe I even ask a friend to see if it makes sense. But yeah, so that's the way I approach, you know, you know uh, my workflow with AI is that I always put myself in the loop. And this is kind of like a personal thing, but I I, I always believe that um, I would rather like I do it myself. I do all my reasoning for myself and then I get it wrong. Then I hand it everything over to the AI and I and its output is wrong and I use its output and then I got like a bad mark. So I would be, it would be more like regrettable in that, you know, latter case where I hand, I hand my fate over to an AI and it just, you know, screw up. <laughs> but yeah, that's my, that's my two cents. Thank you, Tian. Hashini, do you have something to add or be I I would say it's uh yeah I've I've already talked about it this but um you know in terms of augmenting my learning I've used um, generative AI to understand difficult concepts in a simple way um, and you know uh, if there is like a bug in a code that I've been trying to fix for a really long time to run an experiment and then that in that way as well generative AI has helped me understand what might be some areas of um, is issues with my code um, so it has like helped me learn how to like um, write better code for example um, but in terms of um, how I would evaluate the quality and reliability, I would say it's it really comes down to, as Tian said, do the initial work yourself and find resources by yourself that you can then use to cross-reference. And this is especially true when you're, you know, when your work is uh, that the one that's contributing to something that could potentially change how other people in this research area work. Um, uh, so uh, even with tools like Elicit that I mentioned earlier, 
uh, ultimately the solution itself that they developed is proprietary. So even when they're pulling out papers that answer this research question that you have, you don't really know what algorithm or process they followed in the back end to determine the credibility of these research papers that they pulled. Um, are these the most relevant papers? Are these the most um, sound papers? So in order to answer those questions to determine how reliable this output is, you would have to do the initial work and even the continuing work yourself. Um, because um, I, I believe as other panelist members have said, ultimately with at the state generative AI, your the quality of your responses are only as good as the prompts that you give the model. Um, so yeah, those are just some techniques that I use when I'm the, even using generative AI in some part of my research writing. Um, and yeah. Thanks. Kevin. All right. Um, so all the panelists, um, Hashini and uh, everyone else has offered lots of really fantastic points um, on how not to use it and um, on how to uh, try to incorporate it, but be the center of this uh, loop. Um, I would like just to offer some uh, extra tips maybe on how we can maybe just make it better to avoid some of the problems, right? The prompt engineering and some hallucination and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, regarding the, um, the, I would say using being able to tra uh, trace the source is very important. So use using GPT plugins that will cite the source, or simply ask it, uh, cite the source. Where, where where did you find this information, and um, and so on and so forth. This is uh, there are lots of other tools actually that can help you to do that. There are search engines. For example, like perplexity, and uh, nowadays uh, even Google, I think, is coming with uh, some research-based uh, search tools where you can search uh, using AI, a combination of that and the traditional search. And uh, these are just some of the ways to make sure that, oh, if they do have an answer, um, that you may also check where is that source. And so you are still kind of at the center. And another way I think is very cool uh, technology, well, not technology, idea that came out of this is uh, uh, some AI are trained, not trained, they are, uh, they have a chain of thought. Uh, some of the, the ones that we might know actually, like Devin, the AI software, uh, is actually built based on la large language models and chain of thought. So basically uh, the AIs, when you prompt something, uh, they, yeah, instead of just generating the answer, they will first try to come up with a prompt to query the internet for in, in regards to your query. And then uh, at, with the internet search result, it can come back with more tailored and more detailed responses that has less hallucination and are based on the results that it, found, uh, it, has, uh, it has found. And um, some of the other tools uh, we can look into our, for example, retrieval augmented generation. We can use that basically uh, even on ChatGPT. You can build your own bot, right? I actually personally uh, create a bot for every class I have. And so sometimes it just becomes um, even, um, uh, I would say, kind of a search engine for my own course on steroids. And uh, that basically gives me uh, it makes me more efficient at looking my, at my course material and synthesizing stuff that I want to. And there are lots of tools on the market. I might not even know 1% of them. So I would say just keep an open mind, look for more things, uh, look for things like reverse engineering and different tools and to make the generation process smoother, better, and uh, more accurate. And uh, that is definitely a, an aspect to look at while we are um, we need to watch out for the pitfalls and the places where uh, the areas that we shouldn't uh, uh, use AI for. But yeah, that's uh, some uh, some of my tips and how I use it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Um, this is going to be the last set of uh, question, well, structured question, um, before we move into our secret thought. So William and Jacqueline, some 
some closing before we move on. Yeah, some closing remark. Yeah, so this question has been talked about a couple of times, just by Tian and Kevin, when you're trying to evaluate what you don't know. But I guess the most important part is just digital literacy. And I think there's something that is not really taught enough in school, just evaluating information online. I think humans, we trust too much information online. If someone says it in a comment or you see it online, people just trust it for some reason. But I think whenever you hear something online or something from ChatGPT or any AI tool, you shouldn't just immediately trust it, which unfortunately I think most of us do. I have friends who like share Instagram reels or like TikToks, and then they don't even realize they're sharing an ad. It's just because we see information and we just believe it's real. And so I think the main thing is just critical thinking. Whenever you see something, you do a double take and ask, first of all, does this make sense logically? And if you're not too sure, then, well, usually it's not too long of a process to actually check information online. So if it's coursework, you can check your notes, you can check your textbook, or again, you can go back to a Google search and just see if something else has been said. But we don't know where that data come, came from. Usually on like free tools like ChatGPT, don't actually cite the sources, but with tools like Perplexity that Kevin mentioned, then they will provide some sources. So if they give those, then definitely look at those. And I'll also address some uh, questions directed in Q&A. When I compared it to uh, Google search, like what's the pros and cons compared to Google search? What's the good and what's the bad? And while you always do get an answer, well, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you might have seen like the, the response, like as a large language model, I cannot answer this question, but as you see stuff related to like things that just can't be answered, like, hey, predict the future stock price like that. That's where you'll get those kind of answers. So I'm not talking about those, but I think in general, whenever you ask something more opinion related, it will give you an answer. It's like, hey, I think this, this will lay it out. But then at the end, it will say something along the lines of, you should definitely do your own research, check this at the end, stuff like that. But for like more factual things, like a math or a coding question, in my experience, I have not seen it say, I don't know. It always gives you an answer. And that's kind of a double-edged sword. Like you got something, but if you trust it, then that's a major issue. Luckily for code, you can always run the code, but for math, then you can you can kind you need to check your steps. But in terms of the good or the bad, well, it's nice that you got something, but honestly, I think the non-answer or I don't know should be used more about language long language models. I would like to see an answer more. Like, I don't know. I can't answer this. Because humans would probably say that more often. Like if someone asks you a question and you don't know, you probably say, sorry, I don't know. You wouldn't try to start answering it and like, hey, actually, I wasn't that confident in my answer. So that's something I wish we'd have more of, where language, long, language models were more like transparent about what they know and what they don't know. But unfortunately, humans don't like that answer. If, if your tool said, I don't know, you're probably going to think that's a bad response, even though that probably is like the good response it should give. And since they use like some human, like, what's it called? Human evaluation, where you can like, Sometimes you might see two options and you pick which is better. If one option said, I don't know, versus the one that gave you an answer, humans probably like the answer that was an answer versus the one that said, I don't know. So be the human in a loop, I guess, critical thinking, and then not answering or not answer might be a good thing. Thank you, William. Jacqueline? Yeah, I think um, what William mentioned about digital literacy promotion is super important. And that is like how I plan to be a responsible human in the loop. So personally, uh, I mean, like as a user, I would definitely be more mindful of what kind of information and data I'm sharing with the Gen AI tools. So for sure, um, yeah, uh, it is very convenient <laughs> for you to use them, but like, uh, at the same time, we should always understand like the privacy, uh, the privacy concerns of using these tools. So what I'm doing uh, as like a user of these tools, I always look into the privacy policies. So that is like how my data is going to be stored and how are they going to be using uh, my data. So this is uh, something on a personal level that I would do. Um, like this is like uh, as a human, I can make this decision, right? So, um, and also I also keep track of the development of these tools since uh, they are like uh, developing so fast and uh, kind of like keeping track of how they are developing, uh, can educate myself with the most recent topics or concerns or um, controversies related to these tools so that I am aware of uh, what are the benefits or shortcomings of uh, using these tools. And uh, on top of uh, the personal level and as a student, <laughs> a library school student, I'll say um, like uh, being a human in the loop 
uh, means to me that I should be a person who advocate responsible use of AI among students and also other parties in the educational context, because uh, um, I, I guess like everyone would uh, agree that these tools are more integrated in education now, and it's inevitable for us to like um, see um, I mean, like witness uh, how these tools become part of our education. So I believe it's very important uh, for all of us to have um, the awareness of using these tools uh, mindfully and also in a responsible manner that does not violate, uh, say, academic integrity or other uh, privacy issues or maybe ethical issues. Thank you very much, all the panelists, for sharing and following the prompt. So like I shared at the beginning, we met last week. And then the student looking at my questions and say, but Julie, we have not addressed. I am, I'm paraphrasing them. So I come up with the following slide, but there's still something that I haven't captured. I'm going to let them tell you other, there are other secret thoughts that may have developed over the weekend. Again, some of the questions they ask are, how have educators, I would com consider myself one of the educators here in the com education community here at UBC, prepare ourselves for Gen AI. Can they ask me, can educator please design meaningful assignment to encourage learning, to check our critical thinking, for example? How will educators revise the courses and assignments to prepare students to co-live, co-learn with Gen AI? And I am going to pick on William because he was actually the first person who asked this question. He also talked about cheating, academic misconduct. William, come on, ask your question. Say everything that you want to say and same as all the other students. This is your this, this is a free for all time for you to, to say anything you'd like to say. And at the same time, I would also like to address um, to the audience, continue with your questions. I know some of the students try to incorporate their responses um, and answer your questions along the way. I know that behind the scenes, they're typing the answers. Uh, so much is going on here, but keep the questions coming. Um, we have a healthy amount of time to respond to your questions. William, please tell us other things that you're thinking. Yeah, this has slowly kind of been mentioned throughout the entire thing, especially with plagiarism, but there are the dark sides of AI and academic misconduct is a huge one. And I would say in general that cheating is nothing new. Like cheating has always happened, but what generative AI has done is just it lowered the floor. So maybe students who wouldn't cheat before because it's so hard to get into, like you have to buy a tutor, you have to pay for these tools, whatever. Now the floor is lower, so a lot more people can do it. So if you had these like issues in your course where students could cheat on something, then now more students can like, you know, your whole has become like a leaking, a dam. So that's what I'll say towards like academic misconduct and what generative AI has changed in general. But also most students, I feel like, you know, we're, we want to learn. We're here to learn, as, especially as you get up, up in years, you know, you're not forced to take these courses. You're taking courses that you enjoy. Students want to learn. But then what, what would cause a student to, you know, go to the dark side of, at least from what I've seen. I would say that you're competing with time. If students had infinite time, then we could dedicate all the resources to the best ways to learn, but that's just not the case. So then how can you make it like easier for students to learn or just encourage them to focus on the learning experience and not try to take shortcuts? Because that's what it can be. It can be a huge shortcut, try to get past it. And so if your assignments or your design is really difficult to follow. If your course is unstructured, students don't know what to be studying for or what to do, then that makes it really hard. And also if you have like an assignment, if the question makes absolutely no sense, students have no idea how to get started, then that's also a major issue. Students will either just not do it, or again, try to resort to cheating to just get something there. So if you're designing an assignment, then maybe have like subsections that like lead up to it. So maybe some parts are easier and then build up the foundation so students have the foundation before they tackle like, the hardest part of the assignment, or also just have some hints. Just the various things to just make it easier for students to get started. Because again, you're dealing with generative AI, which lowers the floor and just makes it, it's like a kind of like a mental struggle, you know? Like, you know, you should be working hard, but then at the back of your mind, like, oh, I could just ask AI to do it. Like, I don't have to do the work. 
I can just save myself so much time. But that's like the struggle you're dealing with. So if you can kind of like mitigate that in some sort of sense, discourage students from like being lazy, then I think you can have like, that's how, that's the best way to tackle this issue. Thank you, William. Any other panelists want to chime in? Yeah, so I, so as I said, uh, I, I mentioned uh, before, I am, I just finished my fourth year and actually in my, in my first term of my fourth year, um, I, I, I was in a course that has a very, I, I, I think it's a very unique uh, system of grading. So, and, and I believe that system of grading could be, you know, beneficial to in terms of you know how we can co-live with generative ai in, in, in education so it goes like this so the course component like the grading component of the course has two two components and the first component is effort based so it's it's relatively easy and it, as long as you put in effort you get the grades right but then but then the effort based grade could just to sum into total to like what like 50 or like 55 or 60. Okay, so uh, so and then the rest is test based, right? So test based like you have to be in person to take to take the test. So that would kind of mitigate the ability to cheat or although of course like people can cheat in person too, but again, you know, when you take a test, the the chance that you cheat is pretty minimal. So so what I so the 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 way I think it's beneficial is that because with the effort based component, um, you kind of be because it's designed to be easy, and if you put in the effort, you get the grades. Uh, it will kind of discourage students to you know using an external tool to cheat, like you know just handing over your assignment to ChatGPT, for example. But then, since the component is so low, okay, so say that the a student that a student going to use like a tool to cheat anyway, then at most they would they get like you know, like a 50. So they, they pass, but it's not a good score, right? For, uh, it's also like, because they also have like the rest 40 or 50% as a test base, then they will still have to study hard to actually pass the test base component, right? So I think that kind of marking scheme may be beneficial because at, uh, on the first play, like we, we can really just you know, patrol these rules that, like, you know, we can really say that, oh, I think, I think you use ChatGPT uh, in in your assignment, and you you're going to enforce this rule like a hundred percent, like for like each student, like you manually checking them. So I think it's not possible to do that. So it's better to you know create such a a yeah a a grading scheme that discourages the use of you know those tools in the first place, because you know having that component that is very easy to get uh, the effort component, the grade is very easy to obtain. But then you have the test-based component, which really tests your understanding of like how deeply you understand the material. I believe that's very useful to um you know, um. To students, so that we can you know uh, encourage them to use the tool in a, you know, more effective way and you know more productive productive way. I say, yeah. Thank you, Tian. More grading grading strategies. What is a gray? What do we reward? The student's effort, the deep understanding? Yes. Or maybe the use of chat GTPT or Gen AI? Uh, I think, uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to add to Tian's really good point that assignments should test on, you know, hard skills, critical thinking instead of just write a program that does this. But um, and on top of that, I'm also involved as I answered a, a question in the chat, I'm involved in two separate instances where I'm working with course instructors to build generative AI based tools, but they're very different purposes. So the first one is um, I'm using a large language model to build an auto grader that can help provide students with almost near instant feedback on their assignments. Um, and this is um, the it's especially useful to use it in this context for large classes where you have 100 plus students because 
In those cases, for every single assignment, it can be quite difficult for TAs to provide really detailed, personalized feedback. So um, that is one avenue where um, I'm using generative AI in an educational context. And the other one is for a different course where I have um, permission from the instructor to access the course materials, the syllabus, um, the chapters, uh, so on and so forth. And I'm working towards building a generative AI-based TA, um, which kind of implements like a RAG network. RAG is essentially the large language model uh, reads the, stu the human query and then it pulls out documents that are the most relevant and sound and accurate uh, related to that query. Then it goes through those documents and provides an answer. And RAG has been used in research to kind of reduce um, the likelihood of the model hallucinating. So there I'm trying to leverage um, these resources that we obtained from the instructor to have like a TA that is accessible to students at any time of the day. You know, uh, there's no specific office hours, uh, like even like late nights, for example, or just before assignment deadlines. So this is another case where we, you could use generative AI to actually help student learning. Um, so uh, yeah, there are like lots of different creative ways in which you can use generative generative AI in educational context. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope that other instructors are also uh, more um, interested in using these technologies as well. Thank you. Yes. The students are hoping that we will use it more. But at the same time, I would like to leave. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes left. I do have one more question to the audience, but I will leave it to the end. And then I know William, you are ready to answer one of the first one of the questions in, that's been asked. Um, may I ask you to get started? And Jacqueline is ready to for the next one. And then other panelists, if you notice that there's a questions that you would like to respond to, go ahead, please. We have about twelve minutes left. Okay. Yeah. There's been one question about personal information. I mentioned that, like for time ChatGPT, I had a feature where if you say, I am blank, blank, it will update its memory about you. So then just to have that context for future like chats. Well, I didn't really like that when I saw it, like memory updated, like, well, that's kind of weird. Like I didn't tell you to do that. But then again, there's so many tools like social media, they're learning from you constantly and they're not telling you that they're taking your personal information to design the algorithm to give you better recommendations. So there was transparency in that. But when I saw that, if I can remove it, I can, and which I did actually remove because I don't want that there because it's like, well, that's kind of creepy on me. But in terms of the trade-off, like, I would say most people, honestly, they, they don't care that much. If they have the option to opt out, like they will opt out. But if you don't say it, and most companies don't, like they will just take it. For example, like your Twitter algorithm, your Instagram reels, your TikToks, if they just took all the information out and you got terrible recommendation, I think everyone would be would be pretty mad. So there is a trade-off in that sense where you do get a better like experience if it's personalized, but then how much are you willing to sacrifice? And that's the trade-off. But I think unfortunately most people like they they will make that sacrifice. And there's been another question about the environmental cost. And yeah, this doesn't get talked about enough. Like when you talk about these AI tools, it's usually like a side tangent, like, hey, oh yeah, by the way, this is really bad for the environment. And that's about it. So to talk about the environmental impact is not talked about enough. Like these use tons of power. For example, when I try to run a 13 billion model that you can run locally on your laptop, why Mac it drains the power. It's like I'm moving 1% every five seconds. It's, it's crazy. And these models are like 10, 20 times bigger, 200 billion parameters. Think about all the power it's using. So it doesn't get talked enough, talk enough about. And I guess the first step to like spread awareness because again, most people probably don't know or understand like why it's using power. Like, hey, this is like the internet. Like there's no environment to it. This is digital. So there's kind of a disconnect right there of how it actually impacts because there's physical servers somewhere using tons of power. So that's the, like, the first part, just spreading awareness. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add to uh, William's really good point about um, the other considerations. Um, in, in fact, on, on top of even power, the other issue is with all these large language model research, all these new abilities, they're happening in one language. 
uh, versus, you know, there's so many other languages. So there's so many dead languages that require people to learn more. And unfortunately, a lot of the research tends to only be focused on when one specific area and then bettering that area as much as possible instead of increasing the breadth of research improvements. And I think it kind of comes in this research mindset of publish or perish, where people just want to work on research and write papers that can get the most citations, that can have the most you know, quantifiable impact by specific metrics. And that kind of also addresses the energy consumption, because when you, when you see a new model, when you read a new paper, the way they describe that this is a better model is just the accuracy improvement. That, oh, this model that can now do question answering by like a 3% increase in accuracy. So I think even from a resource standpoint, um, there has to be efforts that have to be made to also release energy reports for how these results were obtained, because then that will bring into the question, is this three-person model improvement really worth the $250,000 in energy costs and electricity? Or can we better use the resources that we have to ensure that there's equal level of development in other areas of research, which are clearly, they don't have a lot of interest in them at the, at the moment, so. Jacqueline. Yeah, so yeah, William and Ashini's response are uh, brilliant. And environmental impact certainly is something that um like we kind of like overlook when we're using Gen AI tools. And uh, I would like to respond to the question about how I'm preparing myself uh, um, or educating myself or like the people, maybe my research team or the people around me about, about privacy policies when using Gen AI tools like ChatGPT and also the potential copyright violation since uh, that is like highly relevant to my major. So like uh, I share a little bit about like how I, uh, whenever I'm choosing to use a, um, uh, Gen AI tool like ChatGPT, I did uh look at like look into what is in the po um privacy policies, and then one thing that I uh would not do uh that is more of the copyright uh side of things. That is like I I actually I never copy any research paper <laughs> to ChatGPT <laughs> to uh do a summary. I know a lot of students uh did that, but like that's uh since I understand that actually this is uh, if you look in the privacy policy of ChatGPT, you will know that uh what they call the input and the output that is like everything that you put into it and everything it generates uh is used for its training data. So in this sense, actually you're kind of like feeding uh ChatGPT with some like um content that like uh, is not um, kind of like permitted by the author when you're using it. So I think that is like something that a lot of people overlooked, at least from my uh, from my uh, personal experience that I know a lot of people, they're actually like using ChatGPT for summarizing um, um, like uh, content. And uh, actually, I mean, uh, I think like earlier in the panel, um, there are like other existing Gen AI, uh, Gen AI tools. Like for example, one I can remember is like SciSpace. So this is like basically a, a platform that can, uh, they're like using open access um um like uh open access uh research papers and then they're creating summaries and uh, i believe and also i believe uh they're um that kind of like clear the copyright concerns in this sense because like those platforms they should have been like working on all these things but it's not like i, I downloaded the paper from like say the ubc database and then i just feed it to ChatGPT. So technically in this sense i'm kind of like filing a copyright issue so i think that is like one thing that um uh, like I understand and also I think uh, like in my personal level I would like to like share more <laughs> about this with the peers uh, that I know and also like uh, regarding uh, pr privacy policies I think like other than like looking at the privacy policies itself I find like some resource really useful so for example I know like uh, UBC's uh, um, they have this uh, privacy impact assessment for generative AI instructional use and then they have a professional team to uh, inspect uh, how these tools work and whether it's, uh, there is like a potential risk of a uh, uh, data breach or privacy concerns, all these things. So I think uh, this is a very good point to start to uh, really look into like in a more structured way that like how these tools there are like the risks and also the benefits and whether like we should be like using it in an education or instructional context.
And unless any other questions that you feel comfortable addressing, there are some hard questions here. Um, and they may not feel comfortable addressing what they may not know. These are students. This is our job. And this is something we, my job is going to share some of the questions that you ask to the panelists, which I think they are students only. Um, but we at CTLT will take a look and see what we can do to address some of your questions here. And I, when the students talk about privacy, environmental issues, yes, this is, privacy is something that I know, okay? I know that as educator, as professor and instructors at UBC and lecturer, we need to protect our students. We cannot, there are guidelines, guidance on what we can ask our students to do or use. And, but then there's more than that. It's not just about talking about what can be used and how we are going to use it, but also the reasons behind it. And also now I would know to remind myself to talk about the environmental impact on when I ask, or even when I just say to students, tell the students, you may use it as a starting point when you study. Um, the environmental impact is something that I will mention. So before I let everyone go, I do have one more request to the audience. Um, Manuel, maybe share that last slide, the question. Thank you very much for all the panelists for sharing. And when we met last week, I asked the panelists again that I shared earlier, what is going to bring you joy? Bring all the panelists joy. Come on, they, they are amazing. They share their thoughts, they, they prepare, um, they, they're contributing to our Google Doc, our, no, no, um, to our team and our shares. And um, so, but they really want to know um, what you, what us in the teaching and learning community will help to, what we may be able to do, what we are thinking that we can do to address what they tell us their needs, their hopes in the learning environment. So please feel free, please use the question and answer tool and tell our students. We really hope that this could be a little bit more interactive, but we have the question and answer. Let's use it. Wow. I And I have to admit, I still don't really know how to use the webinar. And I noticed that some of you some of the questions our students has been providing a written response. And I'm not sure where the written response has gone to. Is it, does everyone get to see it except me? Um, or is going back to the person who asked the question? I'm not, so I apologize for my lack of understanding of how the webinar work here, but I know that there's some interaction happening behind. <laughs> or maybe I should know, but I'm, that I'm not seeing. So please, um, before we go, please give some joy to our students. Let them know what we are planning to do. I share one of my immediate thoughts is I may address the environmental impact more in my 